Hi, this is Roger. Thanks for dropping by. Hope you're all surviving, being shut in. <laughs> I think even the prisoners get to walk around the exercise yard, don't they? It does feel a little like that at times. Um, today's chat is going to be basically about why are some orchids just more difficult than others? Why are some difficult or thought of as difficult when others not so much? Um, in reality, none of them are difficult. What is difficult is getting their environment right, as I've said many times before. Um, so, if I think about what I've got in here, um, we, we can get to the point why some are more difficult than others. Now, I've chosen a mixed orchid collection from warm growers right down to cold growers, cooler than cool, cold. <laughs> and they're all trying to survive in here. Um, and the environment in here is right down the middle, temperature-wise, humidity-wise, and light-wise. It's right down the middle. So those that like much lower light have to be accommodated by having stuff above them, like other plants that don't need to be so shaded. Um, so I can adjust lighting. I have highlight shelves, very highlight areas where my couple of andas are, and one of my... Renantheras, the new genus, um, and I have highlight areas that are not quite as bright as that, but nonetheless they're top shelves or positions, hanging racks quite close to the roof. That's quite highlight. And then below that we have what I call medium, which in fact is still good light, and then below that we've got shady. So I can play with light. I've got no problem with that. Um, what I can't do is direct light there is always some form of shading. There is no place in here where anything would get direct light. And quite honestly, direct light through glass is a bit iffy. <laughs> it can be a bit intense and scorch your leaves. Um, so light I can play with. What about humidity? Well, I've got the control. Hurricane Hector will do what it's told. So if I set that to 90% in here, I will get 90%. I use a hell of a lot of RO water to do it, but I could do it. We've then generated a cloud forest. And because the um, mist that comes out of that thing has a dramatic cooling effect, um, I know that. I've, I've only got to stand anywhere near it, and it's cold. It's really cold mist that comes out. Oh, hang on, fans have just clicked on. We'll do without them for a minute or two. Um, so I could create a cloud forest environment, and that heavy humidity would be ideal for some of the plants I've got. They'd love it. And the fact that that mist is, has a dramatic cooling effect as well, I could keep temperatures lower than they would normally be by just dramatically increasing the humidity using that humidifier. It's not just the humidity in the air, it's the fact that it's come out of that unit which really, really cools it before it throws it out. It's just the mechanics of the way it works. And if you think about it, you could get it even cooler. You could chuck some ice in the water and cool the water right down before the humidifier even gets hold of it. <laughs> Walk out here and have icicles hanging off me. Um, so that could be done. But then a lot of the other stuff in here would seriously object and start to rot and not be happy at all. Because that humidity is something that just doesn't exist in the world they would come from. And then you get some orchids are happy with lower humidity, yeah? They also are happy with lower temperatures. But then some like humidity down a bit, but like higher temperatures. Well, I can only do one average in here, and that's where the difficulty comes. And some of the difficulties are of our own making. Um, and a lot of that is media and pot choice. But we can make our lives difficult. I mean, I found out the hard way with my Latoria types. You look up where they come from. Oh, they don't get cold. They like to stay warm. And as a consequence, they're evergreen forests, so they're not going to need any resting or any nonsense like that in the winter. And given the right circumstances, they would probably grow continuously throughout the year. Good stuff. And all of that's true. But not in here, it's not. <laughs> In here, we do get cold in the winter, and they don't like it. So my initial theory, I potted them, number one mistake in here, 
not across the board, but in here. So I potted them, and I thought, well, if these are going to grow throughout the year, they're going to need to, you know, to stay moist to keep them going and everything like that. So we'll have small bark and moss. <laughs> and when we got to the winter time and the temperatures went like that, their growth stopped altogether. They totally stalled and stopped growing. And what happens with small bark and moss? It don't dry out, does it? We got soggy roots and we had a lot of root loss that first winter when a lot of my Latorias were new. So mistake number one. Mistake number two, <laughs> a heat wave that I had no control over. Yeah, we can't help that, that's outdoors, that's the weather, but it was getting seriously hot in here and I couldn't cool it down because the air I was sucking in was higher than the temperature I wanted in here. You know, if I set all my stuff to 28 degrees as my maximum and the air I'm sucking in is 32, all I can do is stop sucking that air in. Um, and by not exchanging the air, it was getting up to like 35, 36 in here. But if I shut it all, at least I could keep the humidity up. Now heat with humidity is less damaging than possibly less temperatures, but without the humidity. So again, you know, these are not errors as such, but problems created by the environment not being right. Um, and as a consequence, the Latorias went downhill badly. Um, almost across the board, they're mounted now. I think I've only got the new one that you've just seen me unbox is potted. It's a very large, substantial plant. And in very soon, what's today, Sunday, that'll be tomorrow's job. And that'll be out in the kitchen, looking at that plant and scratching my head, thinking, can I get away with potting this? Or do I need to mount it? Thinking ahead to what's going to happen in the winter when I get those low temperatures again. If it's in a pot, is it going to stay wet too long because it will stop growing? What do we do? Well, we can put it in a pot. Just put it in large bark or a mix of large and medium bark. So when you pour the water in, it goes straight through and out the bottom and doesn't stay there. So we have control. And sometimes that control is nothing more than the choice of media or the choice to mount or pot, and then what to pot in, yeah? If you want to keep your roots cooler, yeah? Use clay pot. Now, okay, you can't see your roots in the clay pot, but the very fact that the clay absorbs the moisture from inside the pot, from the media, and then evaporates, has a cooling effect. So a clay pot will keep the roots cooler. Um, it can lead to problems because the roots will make their way to the edge of the pot, then they'll attach to the clay pot, then they're going to be a hell of a job to get off. And in addition to that, if it's soft clay, it will evaporate the water very, very fast and actually desiccate the roots that have attached to it. It'll actually dry them out, they'll stop growing, they'll get brown tips because you can't keep them wet enough because as fast as you put the water in the pot, it evaporates. It does keep them cool. <laughs> swings and roundabouts. Um, yeah, so often the choice of media and whether or not you pot will determine your plant's happiness. It's, it's close, close proximity to what it would like best. Now some plants don't do too well mounted, but yes they do. Virtually everything in here, bar one, I think, is an epiphyte. So why won't it grow mounted? Well, why it won't grow mounted, it's not the plant's fault. Whose fault is it? It's me, because I can't keep it moist all the flipping time. Now, if I could, everything in here could be mounted. Doesn't matter how big it is, they could all go on a mount. But boy, would my workload be silly. But would it be silly if I used a sprayer? Because I had to do that in the heat wave last year, I just couldn't keep up with the pressure of having to water that number of plants. So I started using a sprayer. And a few plants, like my Orengus, rotted. They didn't like getting water on them all the time. Yeah? So I lost some plants as a consequence of using a sprayer and being lazy. Um, they were mounted, suiting the roots okay but they didn't like that water getting down in those leaf joints and staying there for an amount of time. I won't say a long time, because in those temperatures the water was evaporating as fast as I could use it. 
Um, yeah, so it's always going to be a happy balance. Um, and we twist it right round, and the best thing I can always advise when people say, can I grow these sort of orchids, my environment is. It's ever so difficult to describe an environment well enough for somebody to make an absolute 100% decision and say, yes, you can grow that. And I would probably choose not to do that. I would say that word, probably. There'll always be a factor or an element you're not sure about. Yeah? You know, I'm, I've got my area where I grow my orchids in the corner of a room. They get pretty good light. That is a vague statement. Pretty good right light in a room is probably probably means quite heavy shade because your eyes play games with you. And um, and I can keep the humidity at around 50, 60 percent. Well, for some orchids, that's that's enough. That's fine. They'll do okay with that. But it, how are you measuring it? How are you topping it up? Is it consistent? Does the air move, or is it totally static air? Are you using a mister that gets your plants wet? Because that don't do them any good. Basically, the mist that comes out of the ultrasonic type, yeah, is cold. Chilling cold. So if you've got your mister above your plants, and that mist comes straight out and falls on your plants, you're chilling them, and it doesn't do them good, especially long term. And getting your plants wet without air movement is also no good. So you just can't, you know, it's, it's all very well people saying my environment is this, this and this and this. But if I could stand there and look at it and be there, I'd probably say, well, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. But it's just one of those things that are difficult to describe. Um, I've said that I come out here sometimes and there is a feeling I've got from visiting botanical gardens, spending huge amounts of time at Kew Gardens when I lived in London. Literally almost every Sunday I used to go to Kew Gardens. And you get a feel when you walk in those tropical glass houses. You walk in the tropical cactus house and you know instantly that that air is dry. And it feels very warm but you know it's dry. And like I'm sort of thinking, well, you can grow orchids in here, mate. <laughs> That's for sure. And then you open the slidey door and walk through the next bit and you think, oh, it's flipping hot in here. And you look at the temperature and it's actually not as hot as it was in the cactus house. But in that second place, the humidity is right up. And that makes you feel hotter. There's a comfortable feeling where you walk into a place and you just think, orchids grow in this. This is right. The humidity is right light filtering through you just sort of you just know and that takes years to just get that feeling to be able to walk in somewhere and think yep this is working this is okay i get days when i do that out here and i walk out here and i can stand here and i know stuff is growing it's doing okay and other days i walk out here and i look around and think what's flipping wrong out here today you know and it's like today the sun comes out goes in again comes out but the temperature outside it's flipping cold below 10 degrees naturally and there's a strong north wind which is chilling so the real feel outside is more like four or five degrees it's more like flipping winter out there today and yet I look now and I sort of think oh the sun's out again it's not raising the temperature in here it's still only 21 degrees yeah so if I turn the fans back on now they won't come on because they've dropped down below their 22 their magic thing <coughs> But that's the real thing, is, is get an environment close to what an orchid needs and it's going to be a happy plant. The only thing that can mess that up then is things like old stale media that will rot your roots because your media is breaking down. Compact media where you've shut the air out. That's not the orchid's fault. That doesn't make them difficult to grow. That just means you've made some pretty tough choices somewhere along there. And some of that might be misinterpreted advice this is a classic one I always love this one water and feed weekly weekly spelt differently obviously weekly as in not strong and weekly as in seven days what a stupid statement but it's a statement geared up to what I've been talking about averages yeah now for some uh, there's orchids out here let me find one uh, there we go 
You water that weekly, weekly, it'll be dead before you reach the end of your first week. Because it dries in hours and needs watering every day in the warmer weather. So if I followed that advice, my telumnias would die. Quite quickly. <laughs> and quite a lot of other stuff because it's mounted. Now that advice is quite common with um, Paphiopedalums. But again, what have you got them potted in? Are they in just bark? Are they in larger bark? I mean, if you look at the way Ed Potts is, his tend to go in pretty chunky stuff. There's no moss or anything in there to keep them moist. He compensates by watering them more often. Yeah? So the media dictates the frequency. So does the temperature. Both, not just one. So in here, in the winter, my few, three, <laughs> paphiopedalums are in small bark with some moss. In the winter, they get watered about every 12 days. Not weekly. If I put water in after seven days, they'd be soggy. And probably by the end of the winter, I would have no roots left. So some advice with the best of intentions is just fundamentally wrong. Because it's not taking all those other factors into account. And this is where the, the, the logic comes in, or the experience, whatever you want to call it, um, and this is where people new to orchids that may be brilliant gardeners and have got some absolutely gorgeous house plants and keep going, why can't I grow orchids? Why do they die? It's because they're not like your other stuff. Most of the ones we get hold of are epiphytes. Get your head round what that really is. Look at some in the wild. Look at how they're growing. Look at where they grow and get it in your head that they don't live in the dirt outside in your garden. Yeah? So that's the main thing, is to get your head round what we're growing here. <sighs> yeah, I think that'll do, actually, because um, I've got <laughs> what I should be doing now is that telumnia I got hold of. I didn't water yesterday, I got sidetracked. So I've gone two days in relatively warm weather. Now it's not as warm today, I sort of I could get away with it, but they must be watered today, no doubt about it. Um, and also my holy clay pots. Now when they come round to their scheduled time, which will vary depending on what sort of days I've had. If I'd have had a sequence of quite warm days where the fans have been on, you know, everything's sort of going. Uh, that's, I don't need to come in here to know what's going on. I can hear it from indoors with the door shut. All this stuff out here makes its own individual noise. <laughs> and when it's all on, that is an individual noise. Extractor and inlet fan have a certain drone to them. These have a whirring sound. Hurricane Hector is, well, that's where he got his nickname, sounds like a hurricane. So everything has its own sound out here. So I know what's going on out here without having to come out here. And if we've had a set of days where this stuff's been on quite a bit, I know that they will have, they will have used up their moisture in the pot quite fast compared with if this stuff isn't on. If this stuff isn't on, chances are the sun's not out and there's not a lot of heat out here. So they're not going to use their moisture up in the pot so often. So again, it's like I always say, chuck the calendar away if, if you can. Now if you live a lifestyle that means on this day I can look after my walk orchids and on the other six days I can't, then that's what you'll have to do. But then don't get orchids that need more attention than that because they won't be happy and they will go down. Maybe slowly and surely. Some orchids can take two or three years to die. <laughs> they do it so slowly you've got a job to see it. It's just the growth rate slows, you know, all this, that and the other. So, uh, yes, the orchids are not difficult. It's getting the environment right. And there are some that are far more tolerant. OK, we're talking species now, but if you go on to the... Um, uh, orchidspecies.com website and look your species up. The giveaway for a more tolerant orchid is when it says cool to warm growing found from 500 meters to 1500 meters. These are giveaways that this plant grows in quite different environments and is okay with that. That makes it a more tolerant orchid for being slightly off at your place which is not on a mountainside or whatever, or 
tropical forests, you know. But then you get some that will say warm to hot growing. Uh, the, hang on, what happened to the cool to warm? No, that's gone. They're warm to hot growing. They come from a place where they don't get low temperatures. If you get low temperatures, they're not going to thrive. Yeah? And some are far more fussy. Some really are fussy. And the, the, the environment where they're found, if you don't replicate that pretty close, they will not thrive. They might not die, but they won't thrive. They won't be like the fit as a butcher's dog thing that I say sometimes. It's just a matter of getting these things as close as you can. And if you can't, maybe that's not the right orchid to choose. I mean, I'm pushing my luck with the Renantheras, but the one, the species I picked, the um, story E, it's one of the more temperature tolerant ones. It doesn't mind slightly lower temperatures. It will put up with them. You won't say it'll be happy, but it will put up with them. And then the hybrid that I bought has got that in it as well. <laughs> and that's crossed with the Vanda. Now, believe it or not, there are cool growing Vandas. They're not all warm growers. And they're not all high light orchids either. So, you know, you've got, you've got, you've got to look stuff up. And um, obviously when you get into species, the deeper into species you get, I've found the more tolerant things become because the conflicts are just bred out of them. So they're, they're, they're just more adaptable and not as demanding for precise environments. That's not always true, but in the main, it, it, it's a bit like that. So, uh, yeah, I need to get on with some watering now. And um, as always, in these times, stay safe, stay at home, stay in. I mean, I've got to venture out at some point next week because I'm, I'm starting to get low on certain types of food. And um, last time I went for food shopping, I came away with stuff I've never bought before on the grounds I couldn't get what I actually wanted, so I had to find some substitutes. And I've had a couple of meals that are totally different to what I've had before. One of them I didn't actually like that much, so we won't do that again, but at least I tried it, and that's better than no food. But there are certain staple things that I just can't get. I can't get potatoes. Now they go with lots of things that I like, and without them, there isn't really a substitute. Um, I mean, I could get frozen chips, but I don't think there's any of them either, because the, the same thing applies. Somebody goes in to get potatoes, can't get any, I'll blow it, we'll have chips then. And I'd rather not. So, uh, but yeah, there's certain things I can't get now. Um, I can't get the rice that I normally get, yet. Um, and again, that will be people that have gone to get potatoes and thought, well, there isn't none. What else can we use? Pasta, rice, let's have some of that then. And that's all gone. Um, I think the panic buying is over. And I think once things are stocking up now, people will only be replacing what they've used up rather than stockpiling. I don't think that's necessary anymore. Um, basically, we've been told to stay in, but we can go out for food, unless you're in a critically endangered group. <laughs> you take, I had a long chat with um, Hannah, my daughter, last night. I'm still worried in my mind about her going to work. Now, here's a conflict of interest for you. She's a care worker. Absolutely essential worker. She's allowed to go to work. She's one of the high-risk groups and should be totally isolated. Conflict. What do you do? She's, um, she looks after a girl. Uh, I forget what the girl's got. Spina bifida, I think. But she can't move, basically. She has to have drip feeds and has to have constant 24-hour cover attention with somebody with her in case things go wrong so that's where she goes same house same people only one daughter no other children in the house the mum and dad are both doctors the bloke is away he hardly ever comes home but he is out of that house the mother has decided to totally self-isolate so that she can do quite a few of the shifts looking after her daughter so that she doesn't have to have any agency staff in, which are the backup for Hannah when she's not there, who does one of the longer shifts. So now the only person coming into the house is Hannah. And Hannah, if it wasn't for going to work, would be self-isolated. 
Her mum is now doing her shopping for her, leaving it on the doorstep, ringing the bell, stepping right back, making sure she comes to get the shopping and walking away. So she's not going in. So I feel a bit better about it. But um, yeah, a little bit of a conflict there. You're in the, one of the highest risk groups, but you're also <laughs> one of the high necessity workers that should go to work. Uh, uh. If I said to Hannah, you should not go to work, you should stay at home and I'll pay your bills, because obviously she wouldn't get any money if she didn't go to work, or not much anyway, she still wouldn't do it. She loves that job and she wants to do it. You know, she feels like it's a, a need to help. She's one of those people, she just likes to help. Um, anyway, so that's enough waffle, and um, I will see you tomorrow for kitchen time for the two new orchids. Um, that's the only boxes, that, that was it, that was the last package that I'm expecting. Um, I can't think of anything else I'm going to get. Those were spur of the moment purchases. And quite honestly, a little bit of retail therapy now and again is probably going to be something I'll be doing on the grounds I have no orchid activities, no meetings. Two meetings a month, gone. All those people I would meet and chat to, gone. Yeah, No shows to look forward to including what was going to be a biggie. Um, you remember our 60th anniversary show at the Castle, that big show, yeah? Well, in collaboration with the British Orchid Council, we were going to do another one at the Castle for them. So we'd be the hosts, if you like. That's all off. <laughs> so yeah, the, the Orchid world has ground to a halt. So what's left? Online. And talking of online, 4th of April, are you getting your pictures ready? The orchid doesn't have to be now. It's only the posting of the pictures and the videos that's now on the 4th of April. When you took the pictures or when you filmed your orchid, that can, that, that can be, well, <laughs> if you remember to do it weeks ago. So get your stuff ready so that on the 4th you're ready to go. Let's make this a big event. And don't forget, hashtag GVOS2020. And... Whatever your orchid is, that's the first bit of text in its title, its name, is to get that code in, followed by what the orchid is or what, what, what it's about. But get that code up the front of any words that go in front of it. That will make any search engine go straight to them. So that's the theory. And um, I mean, I'm okay. I, I will probably get on and start filming mine tomorrow or the day after because the fourth will come round quicker than you imagine, like lots of things do. So, uh, yeah, anyway, thanks for dropping by. Be safe. Stay at home. See you later. <laughs>